Amen. Good morning. It is so good to see you guys. You guys look beautiful with a few exceptions. I'm not going to say anything about Steve or anything like that, but, uh, you know, uh, this is the first time I think in my life I was complimented how well I sang. And I, and I heard Dwayne say that, and I just took the compliment and ran with it. I said, thank you. Thank you for telling me that I sound good. No one's ever told me that before in my entire life. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This handsome young man here beside me uh, is a dear friend of mine. Actually, we've known each other. In October will be 28 years. And uh, Dave actually has uh, uh, been a uh, uh, contemporary in our campus ministries together. And uh, he's visiting his mom here. I just wanted him uh, to share a little bit. And for us to understand here in the Ottawa Church that we have brothers and sisters literally all across the world, that we're not fighting this battle on our own. And so just uh, I'm just going to have him share a little bit. And Dave, no bad stuff about me, okay? <laughs> I was young then. All right. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have the photos, but his hair one time, like... <laughs> Amen. It's so good to be here. Ottawa is like a second home for me. Uh, if you don't know me, uh, I actually spent my teen years here. and I had My mom's here, my brother's here. And uh, so I visit a lot. Well, not a lot. I visit every Christmas. And you aren't here, so I can't visit. Um, I used to visit a little bit more. I'm going to try to make it more of a habit uh, to come up and see you all. It's so encouraging to see everyone. Uh, as Tony said, he uh, pushed me into the water uh, 28 <laughs> years ago almost. Uh, I still remember it uh, vividly, sitting in my living room, and he's like, so David, do you want to get baptized? And I was like, whoa. Um, <laughs> but it's an uh, amazing time back in the campus. So any campus people here, you have lifelong re relationships that you are building. Cherish those. Um, Tony and I, uh, Tony was the king of hangout uh, time back then. Maybe he still is. Uh, <laughs> But it just it built so much family and so many relationships. I'm still so close to many of those people. I have actually stayed in Toronto, in the central region, my entire time. Where I was in the downtown region, but uh, then we merged with the north, and then we were central region. It's awesome. But I have not stayed still. Not only is Toronto awesome, but my, wi my, my wife now, uh, just a quick brief about me, I started in campus. I went to singles. I got married. I was widowed, and I moved back to singles. And then God blessed me, and I got married again. And my wife, uh, currently, she's from Mexico. So my homes are Toronto, then Ottawa, yes. then Mexico. Yes. Uh, my wife loves to travel. So we have visited the disciples and been warmly greeted in Hawaii, Vancouver, uh, Ottawa, of course. Um, Mexico, all over the place, multiple places. Uh, we have visited the church in Paris, uh, France as well. That was, God led us there by a miracle because we had directions that were so wrong. <laughs> but we still managed to find them. And you know, I was going to Norway after that, and there was a brother from Norway visiting the Paris church that day. So this is just an incredible worldwide movement. I have friends all over the place. I've gone on some of the Disciples Today trips, met people from everywhere. Cruises, it's just amazing. So please, these relationships are lifelong, and they are key to you staying, uh, keeping your sanity, keeping your faith, because that is what it's all about. So uh, it's encouraging to see you all here. I would say, Tony, what, this is about the size of campus when uh, I first it's joined, that, so uh, that's, exactly right. that's just about what I remember for the meeting. So <laughs> I, it's good to see a, a healthy group. Many of you I recognize, and some I, I, I'm going to be honest, I forget a lot of your names. So I'm just <laughs> getting that old. So thank you for uh, having me here, and thank you, Tony, for letting me thank say Thank you for coming here, brother. You know, uh, when, when you see people that you've developed relationships with over a period of time, it's like opening up a, a photo album and floods of memories and uh, absolutely unbelievably great memories. And uh, Dave, it is so good to see you and uh, it's so great to see your faithfulness and 
uh, in spite of some challenges that they've went through in his life, uh, he is a faithful, fired up disciple and it inspires me uh, to keep on going. So, amen. I totally was not planned. We got together with the campus on Friday. I told them the exact same thing. The, the relationships that you form in the campus ministry, uh, it really is a treasure that we pull from uh, continuously in our lives. Uh, like I, uh, like uh, Dwayne said, in a few moments, uh, the, uh, the real reason why we're here is to witness Barry get baptized into Christ. And so in the meanwhile, if you can put up with me for a few minutes, that will be great. All right. The title of our sermon this morning is Making It Rain. All right. Of course, this is, if you're visiting with us, um, I don't know where you've been, but you've missed a lot. <laughs> and and uh, I heard, I don't know if you guys heard it, I heard Dave saying that he's going to come to Ottawa much more often now. So we're going to hold him to that and uh, make sure that that happens. Of course, this is the epic battle between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. This is one of the most remarkable confrontations that we see in the scriptures. A battle so intense. And yet we will see how God wins victories after victories after victories. And prayerfully as we continue to see how great our God is that we will put our faith in him and trust him in all that we are and all that we have. So great to be inspired and encouraged and center our thoughts on what Christ has done on our behalf and for us as uh, Dwayne and Julie shared about their journey in their life and helped me to think about what Christ has done and what, how, how Christ sent, transcends all situations to give us peace that really the world does not understand. First Kings chapter 16. Let's go ahead and turn there. This is a time, of course, let's give a little bit of history. Context is everything. Um, this is about a hundred years after David was king of Israel. Okay? That's when the kingdom of, uh, uh, the kingdom of Israel was a uh, united kingdom. And it was... David is considered, of course, Israel's greatest human king. We know Israel's greatest king was, amen, was God, right? He was Israel's greatest human king. And we realize that uh, he actually, incredible exploits, as all the lands that were over, given over to the Canaanites and really the, the people who, who were part of Canaan, he defeated all the enemies. God led him in great victories. And, and the kingdom of Israel was together at this time. A hundred years later, it was not so. As a matter of fact, the kingdom of Israel had been divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. A few years later, the northern kingdom would uh, actually disappear altogether from the face of the earth. And then the kingdom of Judah, or the southern kingdom, would remain. From that kingdom, of course, as God was rooting a people in history, is where we got Christ the Messiah. And uh, David, uh, Jesus is referred to many times as the king of David. But I wanted to give you a little bit of background. Israel, northern kingdom and southern kingdom, was an incredible, incredible read. All northern kingdoms were bad kings. I mean, it is stunning to me. Like I mentioned last week, one of the reasons I firmly believe that this is the word of God is that God does not make it look pretty. If you're going to make up a fairy tale, you're going to make it sound and look pretty. But that was not the case here. As a matter of fact, let's read a little bit about what the king of the northern kingdom was like. In chapter 16, in verse 30, it says this. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all those who were before him. That is not something you want to have in your resume. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he, he took 
four. Let's keep going. Okay. He took for himself a wife, Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. I'll explain to that, uh, that what th that is in a second. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the Israelites, uh, Israel kings who were before him. Would you think about that for a second? This is the resume of one of the kings of the northern kingdom. It was not a good time. One of the things, of course, that we talked about that really, really God reminded the Israelites to do is to remember the Lord your God. And we realize that God is a jealous God and that when we run after other gods, he is not pleased with that. So that's the background, okay? So we see Ahab right now is the king of the northern kingdom, and uh, we have now a guy by the name of Elisha who com Elijah who comes on the scene. Israel is in rampant, northern Israel is in rampant idolatry. The prophets of Baal, Baal was a male god that they worship, and Asherah was a female god that they worship. At this time, they had 850 total prophets that were uh, worshiping, that they were worshiping, preaching on behalf of these false gods. It was not a good time in the kingdom of Israel. The people of God have given their hearts over to other gods. And it was incredibly concerning to our God. And so what does God do as he did in the book of Judges? He said, I want to get your attention. I want to bring you back to worshiping me and giving me all the honor and glory that is due me. And invariably, king after king, time after time, the people were led astray because the worshiping of other gods was tolerated, was encouraged. And we pick it up in chapter 17, in verse 1. And we read about what God says he's going to do. He says, I am going to make it stop raining. There's going to be a drought for about three years. In, in chapter 17, verse 1. I'll go there. Okay. Are we having trouble this morning? Okay, then I'll go ahead and read from my Bible here. Okay, great. Awesome. Acts chapter 17. Uh, sorry, 1 Kings chapter 17. It says, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As certainly as the Lord of God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be no dew or rain in the years ahead unless I give the command. The Lord told him, Leave here and travel eastward. And so God says to Elijah, I want you to understand. I want you to tell this king, there is going to be a famine. There's going to be no rain for three years. In an already dry place, this even speaks incredible, incredible. Uh, uh, it, it, it speaks volumes about what we're talking about. So Elijah says, there's going to be a drought for three years. God is setting up a confrontation here ultimately where he's going to bring about a victory. He always does. And so what happens was right after this, um, of course, there's no rain. Uh, the brook dries up. God sends Elijah to a brook. He says, listen, you go and you stay there. And the Bible tells us that ravens brought bread for Elijah. I mean, that's pretty good. That must have been good bread. When God makes bread, it must be good bread. And then afterwards, he, the brook got dried up, and they went to a woman's house. 
And he went to the woman, and the woman said, he said to the woman, I want you to bake me some bread. Apparently, he was really into bread. And the woman says, hey, listen, I've got nothing left. All I've got is a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. And when I'm done baking um, some bread for my son and I, we're going to die because there's nothing left here. Elijah said, listen, if you make me some bread, you're going to have enough oil and flour, and it will never run out from that jar that you have. Subsequently, that's exactly what happened. I really believe what God is doing here. He is helping Elijah with his faith. As he was supplying Elijah with bread and water in a time of famine, he was helping with his faith. Oftentimes, in our lives, as we're going through challenging times, especially if you're a redeemed servant of Christ, that God is allowing you to go through times ultimately to build your faith. I can tell you this. Most of the growth in my life occurred through times of testing and trials. As a matter of fact, times of blessings are great, but oftentimes it can lead to self-reliance and arrogance. And so we got to be careful what we wish for. Most of the godless countries in this world are countries that are wealthy. Who have ability to store and pack away things. And I tell you, I, I'll confess freely. I am challenged in my heart because we have so much. And sometimes I buy into what the world teaches. I get worried and concerned about my retirement. And as I look about other people, and I say, well, this is what they have. And I buy into these things. And then I catch myself, but invariably, I fall into it again and again and again. God's getting the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, he's getting his attention. He says, there's not going to be any water from heaven. Elijah sends this word. Oftentimes, and it's the same case with Ahab, they got upset at the messenger. It's a very common thing. Even in this day and age. When somebody speaks the truth, especially through the scriptures, we get really, really upset at the messenger. I do. And you know what I say? I'm 50 years old, man. Who are you to tell me? Who died and made you king? What audacity do you have to say that to me? I mean, there are times when I sat in the seat that you sat in, and someone would be talking about something, and my instinctive response, if you don't know me, you don't know what I'm going through. And someone is mustering up to speak the truth. Probably have to go in a closet and pray for boldness. And at times, I try to shoot the messenger. So he pronounces that there is going to be a famine in northern Israel. We pick it up in chapter 18. Okay? In verse 1, that's what, he, that's what he says. And we're getting to the crux of the matter here. It says, sometime later in the third year of the famine, the Lord told Elijah, go make an appearance before Ahab so I may send rain on the surface of the ground. So Elijah went to make an appearance before Ahab. 
Now the famine was severe in Samaria. So what happens now? God says, it's about time. Okay, it's been three years. Let's go and confront Ahab what's going on right here. At the same time, Ahab has run out of water. He needs to feed his livestock. So he had a, another guy by the name of Obadiah, and Ahab went in search of some water. One goes one way, the other goes the other way. Obadiah is going looking for water, and so we pick it up in verse 7 to find out what exactly is going on with Obadiah. It says, as Obadiah was traveling along, Elijah met him. When he recognized him, he fell face down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my master, Elijah? He replied, Yes. Go and say to your master, Elijah is back. Obadiah said, What sin have I committed that you are ready to hand your servant over to Ahab for execution? So what happens is, Ahab could, was looking for Elijah the entire three years. Because he wanted to shoot the messenger. And everywhere that Ahab went to look for Elijah, everywhere. And if someone says, Elijah is not here, he had that person swear on oath that he was not there. And if they were to find Elijah, they need to inform Ahab where he was. He was looking all over the earth. And Obadiah says, whoa, 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 whoa. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to see you. I'm going to tell Ahab that you're here, and you know what's going to happen? You're going to be whisked away, and I am going to die. And so he says, listen, what have I done to you that you are setting me up for an execution? And I just said, hold it, my dear friend. I am not going to run away. I am actually going to meet with Ahab today. So that's the scenario, okay? Elijah pronounces a, a, a famine. Ahab is upset. He is really, really upset. He's blaming the messenger. Anybody, everybody now in the, all of northern kingdom of Israel is afraid uh, if they see Elijah because they know it's imminent death. Uh, if Ahab came to them and they could not point the way of where I Elijah was. So we pick it up in verse 16. And here is where the confrontation takes place. When Obadiah went and informed Ahab, the king went to meet Elijah. When he, Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, Is it really you, the one who brings disaster on Israel? Elijah replied, I have not brought disaster on Israel, but you and your father's dynasty have by abandoning the Lord's commands and following the Baals. And so... Other translation says, is, is that you, you troubler of Israel? <coughs> and Elijah said, I haven't caused trouble for Israel. You're pointing your fingers in the wrong direction. <coughs> he wanted to shoot the messenger. He thought because God used Elijah to say what needs to change in this nation, that it was because of Elijah why the famine came. He, that's what happens <coughs> when we're not spiritually fit. We're into blame everybody but myself. It is the oldest sin. Read the book of Genesis. And read the book of Genesis. It's my neighbor. It's my wife. It's the snake. It's my mom. It's my dad. It's my brother. It's my sister. He's pointing it in the wrong direction. He says, listen, man, you've lost your ever-loving mind. In verse 19, now send out messengers and assemble all Israel before me at Mount Carmel, as well as the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, whom Jezebel supports. <coughs> it's rampant idolatry. 
says we need to confront this situation once and for all. It has reached a threshold to the point where it, there's going to be disaster that is going to occur. Ahab sent messengers in verse 20 to all the Israelites and had the prophets assemble at Mount Carmel. Elijah approached all the people and said, How long are you going to be paralyzed by indecision? If the Lord is the true God, then follow him. If Baal is, follow him. But the people did not say a word. Very reminiscent of the book of Revelation where it was pronounced to the people, Listen, I wish you were either hot or cold. Make a decision. But to be lukewarm, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth because it is simply disgusting. And I can't tell you how much today this is reminiscent of our nation, of our continent. That we have a semblance of religiosity. I walk around in, a, in, in Ottawa, you see churches all over. I mean, literally, some of the most prominent buildings are church buildings. People sing songs and make references to spiritual aspects. And there is a malaise, a lukewarmness to our Christianity that our lives are indistinguishable from the world. The divorce rate within churches and the world is literally negligible. They did a survey and they talked about regarding people who go to church who are single and people who are not in the church and what is the rate of fornication, promiscuity, sleeping outside of the marriage bed. It was identical. Then they did a survey of people who were involved in pornography. People in the church were more involved in pornography on the internet than those that were outside of the church on a rate basis. There's no distinguishable. We have problems in the world that if we were in North America to stop funding our military world, we will be able to solve the world's starvation problem if we were to stop it for one month. If Christians were to give just a tithe, we will be able to solve the world's education, the world's evangelization, the world's water problem in one year. It's not an issue of resources. Never has been. And we live in a world where we complain to the government, it's their fault. Doesn't matter who's in power, it's their fault. It is stunning to me having lived in the United States for 17 years, it doesn't matter who was in power. There are just crooks after crooks after crooks. And it stuns me sometimes, disciples, who rely on the political system to war serve the world's problem. Have we lost our minds? It's only getting worse and worse. But the indecision, and I believe, honestly, the same call is for us today. The same call is for us today. Choose whom you will serve. Amen. 
I've got to make those decisions. Who I, will I serve? Being in the full-time ministry today, is this a job for me? Or is this is my passion and I just have to be compensated because I've got to eat? It's a question I've got to ask myself. And I am so concerned today because when I sat in that seat and I, and I look and I see so many people who are simply hanging on to a job. And the pulpit is filled with pop psychology and the word of God is found to be in famine. And somehow we have this consumerism. Make me feel good. And God calls him. He says, listen. How long will you be indecisive? And so we continue. It says in verse 23, Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left, but there are 450 prophets of Baal. Let them bring us two bulls. Let them choose one of the bulls for themselves, cut it up into pieces, place it on the wood, but they must not set it on fire. I will do the same for the other bull and place it on the wood. I will not set it on fire. Then you will invoke the name of your God and I will invoke the name of the Lord. The God who responds with fire will demonstrate that he is the true God. All the people responded, uh, this is a fair test. It's funny, they now respond. When it didn't have to do with them really making a decision, quiet, silence. But when it had to do, oh, we're going to have a show? Super, awesome. How much do I have to pay? What's the mission fee? Okay, it's ten fifty for this movie. Okay, that sounds good. Interesting what they respond to. Elijah told the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls for yourselves and go first. For you are the majority. Invoke the name of your God, but do not light a fire. So they took a bull as he had suggested and prepared it. They invoked the name of Baal from morning till noon saying, Baal, answer us. But there was no sound and no answer. They jumped around on the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them and said, um, yell louder after all. He's a god. He may be deep in thought or perhaps he stepped out on a moment or has taken a trip. Perhaps he's sleeping and needs to be awakened. So they yelled louder and in accordance with their prescribed ritual, mutilated themselves with swords and spears until their bodies were covered with blood. Throughout the afternoon, they were, so, they were in an ecstatic frenzy. There was no sound, no answer, and no response. Amazing. These guys started prancing, dancing, and Elijah started saying, hey, maybe he's asleep, wake him up. Maybe if you shout louder, he's going to wake up. Maybe he's gone on a vacation. Maybe you, you know, just keep going. Maybe while you're doing it, he's going to come back. And the Bible says something here very interesting. That they started shouting so much louder. They were paying so much homage to this God. They started cutting themselves. They started hurting themselves. I can't help but to think it's what we do today. We shake our fist at God. We don't apply the principles that he talks about in his word. Oftentimes to our detriment emotionally, psychologically, even physically. To the point where we hurt ourselves. We see the opioid epidemic. people are going and get drunk and having car accidents and getting raped and being raped and it is stunning to me in our sexual promiscuous culture how many women get raped by people that they know
and they go to church the next Sunday as if nothing happened. They did a statistic on campus. I had to read it seven times to think it was that one out of four girls on campus are raped. One out of four. I don't know, but I know there are women in this room, purely statistically speaking, who some uncle, some friend, some father's friend have raped them. And we go to church on Sunday morning as if nothing has happened. And you and I know that there are people at workplace that have sexual innuendos and joke and they think it's funny. And we look at what the scripture is talking about here. We hurt ourselves. I think one of the best things that has happened in our world is the Me Too movement. And exposure of people who have had systematic abuse must stop. I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is. You know what happens? Those guys who, who, who do those things, it was done to them. And the cycle just continues, and it's never able to end. And they're shouting to this God, and we do the same thing. We run after this God that we serve, the God of money or the God of pleasure, the God of, uh, of reputation or the God of education, whatever it is. Oh, and it's nicely disguised. And the God, the Lord God, is pushed aside. And his words are changed and we form him the way we would like for him to be formed. It says in verse 30, Elijah told them all the people approached me. So all the people approached him. He repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. Then Elijah took the 12 stones corresponding to the number of tribes that descended from Jacob to whom the Lord said, Israel will be your new name. With the stones he constructed an altar for the Lord. Around the altar he made a trench large enough to contain two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut up the bull, and placed it on the wood. Then he said, fill four water jars and pour the water on the offering and on the wood. When they had done so, he said, do it again. And so they did it again. Then he said, do it a third time. So they did it a third time. The water flowed all, uh, down all sides of the altar and filled the trench. When it was time for the evening offering, Elijah the prophet approached the altar and prayed, O Lord God of his, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, prove today that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that, O Lord, you are the true God and you are winning back their allegiance. Then fire fell from, uh, from the Lord, fell from the sky, it consumed the offering, the wood, the stones, the dirt, and licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they threw themselves down with their faces to the ground and said, The Lord is the true God. The Lord is the true God. Elijah told them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let even one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah led them down to the Kishon Valley and executed them there. Let me tell you something. That is a hard verse to read. Elijah told Ahab, go on up and eat and drink, for the sound of a heavy rainstorm can be, can be heard. So Ahab went up to eat and drink while, while Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. He bent down toward the ground and put his face between his knees. He told the servant, go on up, look in the direction of the sea. So he went on up, looked, and reported, there is nothing. Seven times Elijah sent him to look. The seventh time the, child said, the servant said, Look, a small cloud the size of a palm of a man's hand is rising up from the sea. 
Elijah then said, go tell Ahab, hitch up the chariots, go down so that the rain won't overtake you. Meanwhile, the sky was covered with dark clouds, the winds blew, and there was a heavy rainstorm. Ahab rode towards Jezreel. Remarkable. This confrontation between God and the false prophets. And God says, I love what God does. He says, hey, just to make sure that this was not a fluke, that this was not lightning from heaven, that there was not a spark, that there was a sudden forest fire in the dry and arid land, douse it with water, not once, but three times. Dig a trench so that no, none of those things can come here. And of course, we see that fire comes down from heaven and the Lord showed himself as the true God. And what happens? He says, okay, bam. God says this is what, what God's proven himself. Now let's go look for rain. He says, look upon the horizon. Do you see any clouds? I don't see any clouds. He sent them back seven times. Can you imagine? Would you go? Hey, can you go check it out? None there. 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 No, I'm not going to check anything out. <laughs> can you go check it out? None there. Can you go check it out? None there. Can you go check it out? I'm, I don't know if there's anything there. Obviously, he wants an answer. I'm going to tell him there's something there. <laughs> Aram says, okay, that, uh, 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 Elijah says, that's all I need. Bam. Go tell him, not just there's going to be a drizzle. There is going to be such heavy rain. There's going to be such heavy rain. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how great is the God of Elijah? And I think that's a great pronouncement. But I think sometimes we've got to ask the question, not only where is, how great is the God of Elijah, is that we probably have to ask ourselves, where are the Elijahs of God? In this crowd. Where are the Elijahs of God that are willing to stand up And to see God work powerfully. And God made it rain. Out of nothing. And so, we'll close with this verse. James chapter 5. In James chapter 5, we read about Elijah, even in the book of James. In verse 17, this is what it says. A most remarkable verse in all the Bible. Elijah was a human being like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not, that it would not rain and there was no rain on the land for three and a half years. Then he prayed again and the sky gave rain and the land sprouted with the harvest. A lot of times we're thinking, man, Elijah was an awesome prophet, but the Bible tells us he was just like us. Which Elijah amongst our crowd today is going to stand up? And make it rain, if you would, in the city of Ottawa. I love that song we sung, and I believe it with all of my heart. Great things are yet to be done in this city. The question is not God's capability. Uh, there's no doubt about that. The question is, are there going to be Elijahs that are willing to stand up to the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah? 
even as the odds were 850 to 1. You know what was interesting after this story ended? Elijah got discouraged. And you know what God told him? We still have 7,000 people in this city that I have reserved that have not yet bowed to the God Baal. He encouraged his soul. Let me ask you a question. Only you can answer. I, I, I don't want a rah-rah answer. But do you believe that there's people still in this city that needs to hear about this great God? No, no, no. Do you really believe it? Who have you talked to about it then? How can you believe it and not say anything about it? Or are you just like them that the people said nothing? We are not trying to have an entertaining church service, but I hope it entertains. We're not trying to simply make people feel good, even though I hope you feel good. We're about bringing our hearts back to this God. I'm too old to play games, to play church. God won the great victory. As we continue to look at these victories that God is winning, time after time after time, I pray that we're continuing to put our trust and our faith in him.